Mandatory backdoors and internet.org get the open letter of outrage treatment. And somebody's mom wants to help you design your website. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 341 for Tuesday, May 19th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you all of the ingredients to cook fresh, delicious meals with simple step-by-step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. Welcome. I am Megan Maroney. Joining me today is my old friend, Roger Chang. Welcome, Roger. Thank you for having me on the show. Roger, of course, formerly of Tech TV's The Screensavers and Call for Help. Then you were on the first panel of Twit and you worked for Revision 3. Now you work over with Tom Merritt on the Daily Tech News Show. And you're the co-host of East Meets West. How do you have time to do anything else? Uh, you find the time. I mean, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a heavy mix, especially with the newborn. Um, that, that you're looking after, but uh, you find the time. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. Is your baby back there right now? No, she is actually with my wife because she needs to be nursed. Okay. And uh, I don't have the facilities <laughs> to do that in here. <laughs> Thanks for explaining that. <laughs> Let's get to today's big, big tech news. Fresh off his Guinness World Record for breaking 1 million followers on Twitter in the shortest amount of time, at POTUS, also known as Barack Obama, received an open letter from Google, Apple, Facebook, and other tech giants urging him not to provide law enforcement with access to encrypted smartphone data. Now, the companies writing the letter are talking about mandatory backdoors and software. Can you give us just a few reasons why this is a horrible idea? So, I mean, chief amongst, among these is that you weaken the security. So by, by intentionally disabling security in, in, in a manner that allows law enforcement to access encrypted data, you've essentially made a hole in your giant wall uh, of encryption. And so anyone who gets access to those same keys that law enforcement have uh, basically can do an end run around that entire encryption that you've put up, basically making it moot. And this leads to the second problem, which is there's no way to, to set a backdoor that only good guys can use. It's not like you have to answer a morality question that says, are you law enforcement? Yes. If not, and then it just blocks you off. I mean, if you can make it accessible to one group, another group is going to find uh, a way to access that same uh, privilege that law enforcement has. And there's really no way to kind of cleanly do it. There's no way to kind of segment out the encryption so you have various levels, like one for law enforcement and, and one for everyone else. Uh, it, it's kind of an all or one deal or none deal. Right. And we've seen problems with this already. I mean, by old software that's that's done this in the past. I mean, back to the Clinton era, that era that, you know, we're, we're really, you know, it is a problem, a known problem. So what are the kinds of laws, what's the law going to look like that, that the president's considering that would allow for backdoors? Well, so, I mean, this is up to Congress and Congress actually needs to come up with the law and then the, the president can uh, uh, basically uh, write it in. Um, and at this point, it would just essentially give law enforcement uh, – uh, a leg up by basically making it mandatory that these tech companies have this back door that they can access. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's something that I, I'm actually kind of happy to say that both, both, uh, both parties are, are very skeptical of, you know, for different reasons. Um, but generally because, you know, once you do this, is anything else, you know, secure is is when you when you actually go down this path, are you not essentially just removing the the civil rights that you know we supposedly uh, believe in uh, by just assuming that well you know what everyone does something bad and you know what it, I think I liken it to if you just gave law enforcement a copy of uh, a copy of keys to your house to your safety deposit box and your bank and your car on the off chance that you might have something incriminating um, that they could use. It, it, it's, it kind of goes against the whole innocent until, uh, until proven guilty. Rather, it just says, you know, you probably might have done something wrong that eventually we'll, we'll need the information for. So why don't you just hand us the keys to all your pri uh, private data, your privacy, your life. And, you know, when it comes around to it, we can access it. We don't have to bother you. We don't have to do any pesky 
you know, uh, uh, corridors that you need to be involved in. We can do it all right behind your back, completely convenient for them. Right. Well, there is the other side of the argument, of course. I mean, that, that encryption is making it more difficult for the government to do their job, to keep us safe. Do you believe that? You know, the more I think about it, the, what I have to say is law enforcement is a difficult job to begin with. And it's the reason why you actually need a certain education uh, level to, to, to do a lot of these jobs. Um, yeah, it, it does make it difficult. But at the same time, I mean, it's do, do you sacrifice a majority of everyone's privacy just on the off chance that you can catch two or two or three percent uh, of people that use social media or email or, or any kind of sort of encrypted data to do kind of bad things? Um, you know, it's it's kind of a balance in any kind of free society. There's a balance. If not, if we just said, you know, we're under dictatorship, you follow these laws, you can't have encryption, can't lock your doors, you know, your files, medical files, you know. Uh, income files and all that stuff are open for us to see whenever we want. We could do that as well. Then we shouldn't have to pretend that we live in a democracy where, you know, we all have the right to privacy and the right to to be judged uh, without having um, our information kind of surreptitiously taken from us without our consent. All right. Well, let's move on to another story, sort of related. It's another open letter that you pointed to, out to me today. The BBC reports that there are, the protests are growing against Facebook's internet, internet.org. Uh, 67 digital rights groups signed an open letter criticizing internet.org today. Explain a little bit about what their complaint is. So I think to, to explain their complaint, you have to understand what internet.org is. And this is kind of a Zuckerberg-initiated uh, uh, program to broaden out internet access to parts of the world where uh, internet access right now is a luxury or very hard to obtain. And it does this by basically allowing um, certain sites that they select, that internet.org through their panel selects, uh, will get basically zero rated. That means when they get trafficked, uh, the data packets get trafficked over the cellular network for whatever region they're in and they go to a, phone, a smartphone or tablet device, they won't be charged for that data, and which, which sounds great. It's like now you have a way for people who might not otherwise be able to access this information uh, because of the cost. Now they can get all this great internet, except that it's not the internet. And the uh, what these um, what a lot of the complaints have been is that you're basically getting Facebook's version of the internet, and you're getting a curated version because Internet.org gets to pick uh, which which sites, which apps get approved. And by that very act, you have winners and losers. And what, what a lot of the uh, um, complaints come coming from these countries that's going to be uh, that's being rolled out in is that the local developers are saying, well, how come you're picking that guy instead of my app or my website? You know, my website is now at a disadvantage because if someone wants to go to rogerchang.com, let's just pick, pick that, they have to pay a data fee. But my friend, you know, George Wilson across the street, he's been picked his site, anyone can access, and no, they won't get charged. Now, if you're someone who doesn't, you know, can't afford to pay like the ten dollars a month, um, you know, overage fees uh, that you know some places might charge, you would go to George Wilson's site or George Wilson's store or George Wilson's online service because it doesn't cost you anything. And so, by that very nature, it's not net, it's not net neutral. You're picking winners and losers. Right. Yeah. What you're saying, it sounds like it's violating net neutrality, which we just fought for and, and won. So how is he getting around this? So right now, they're, it's, it's a back and forth and they're going through a, a process of like, you know, how do we make it better? But, you know, until the actual program makes it neutral across the board, that means all data gets zero dated or no, or no data gets zero rated, you're going to have that problem. And um, you know, the, the big issue here, of course, is that, again, it's not the Internet. It's Facebook's version of the Internet. And so you get you get kind of a I don't want to say jaundiced because that would be a little too cynical. But you do get a certain perspective of what the Web is or what it seems like it's, it is and what it isn't. And so, you know, you, you essentially have censorship. On a, on a level, even if it's a benign level, right? Even if they say, well, we don't want to show gory stuff. That that very nature, that that very act, you know, it censors uh, information all night. Remember when AOL went through that whole uh, um, controversy when a lot of uh, uh, breast cancer support groups 
were uh, were upset because suddenly all these groups were being blocked because they had breast right. in them or they had pictures. And so, you know, you had legitimate data being blocked by censorship for sensibly for a good cause because they didn't want kids to be exposed to pornography or any kind of lewd information. Um, but, you know, it's, you know, you, you, you by that very act, you, you're, 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 you're messing with the internet and you're ostensibly changing the experience for the person that may adulterate it for the person giving them a false impression or, or denying them access to certain things that they wouldn't uh, have otherwise been able to get. Right. And isn't, aren't there security issues too? I mean, they don't use HTTP, HTTPS and um, isn't that an issue also? The security? So a lot of the encrypt, like it didn't support HTTPS, although in a, in a follow-up blog post recently, they said that they will be implementing it, uh, TLS or SSL encryption. And of course, one of those reasons is because it's, it's, it's an overhead cost on the server side. Um, as well as data. And so, you know, it's like, oh, let's just thin it out a little bit. So, you know, the, the, the data is cheaper and the, the amount of bandwidth you need is smaller. But at the same time, suddenly now you're exposing people who now need to sign up for things like, oh, I want to my, do my banking online. I want to do my store shopping online. You're going through non-encrypted, you know, uh, uh, sites or using a non-secure form of payment, that opens up those individuals to all sorts of uh, potential uh, security threats, especially because a lot of these uh, areas, you know, the only form of internet connected access they have is through their phone. And so it's not like they can go run through and uh, to an individual and say, hey, can you help me out with this? Um, they're kind of left on their own. All right. Well, let's get to another story. The Verge reports that Google is adding tweets to its mobile searches on the Google app in iOS and Android. Uh, is this something that you've been desperately waiting for? I personally have uh, can say no, <laughs> but I, I think it is a, a very important nod to the kind of social potency of Twitter in, in every, at least contemporary American society, where it is considered to have crucial bits of information, whether it's, you know, celebrity gossip or, you know, political uh, speech or any kind of like, you know, where was this person when he said this, when he committed this crime, you know, it's, it's an important outlet. It's just as important as images, uh, as a website, um, as any other kind of social connected uh, data medium that we have right now. And I think it's, I think it's, you know, it's very reflective of our society. It's kind of cool. I think it's, it's nice to be able to use Google's search uh, engine over like going through Twitter and trying to find uh, what Rihanna said on a tweet or will I am uh, tweeted a while back. Um, I think it will grow in importance uh, as Twitter expands its reach beyond uh, the traditional developed countries uh, into new markets. Uh, but it definitely is. I, it's it's definitely it's definitely. I wouldn't say a watershed moment, but it's a very Im important turning point of turning the internet from just web centric into all these other platforms, uh, especially uh, social media. Right, and it might be more timely too. I mean, you know, it's not necessarily more accurate, but Twitter tweets are often they get the news first. So for us, it might be interesting. Yes, to definitely. Yeah. So one last story. Have you seen this website, the user is my mom .com. Uh, The next web is reporting. You can pay this company $75 and Scotty's mom. I have no idea who Scotty is, but presumably he works at this company. His mom will review your site. They'll send you a screencast, give you a proper write up and everything. What do you think about this? Would you use this for your next website, Roger? Uh, maybe not, but I think he's on to something. I think there is a very... Uh, important niche that goes unfulfilled for um, older older individuals who aren't tech savvy, like my dad. My dad is not very tech savvy, and he's always calling me, Roger, I need help with this. Roger, I need help with that. It's one reason why I use remote uh, desktop being so much. Um, but like, if they could expand it beyond just his mother and include other individuals like you know his neighbor or his 65-year-old retiree who loves fishing, and you know, frequents all the phishing forums, but doesn't understand what Twitter is or Facebook or anything like that. I think if you can get a group of those people together, because you know, not everyone sees things in the same way, and it's one reason why focus groups are are used for so many new products. If you can get like maybe five more individuals from different walks of life, you know, different age, uh, social backgrounds, and stuff like that, I think it would be very, uh, very useful. And and when I say age, I mean you know, no one under thirty, but like you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, in a, you know, for example, someone in their 80s might not have any idea what, what the Internet, other, other than the forward-facing 
uh, uh, stuff they see through a web portal. While someone in their 60s might understand it, but they don't know the specifics of how to get from A to B. And so I think there's a lot of things that would would help. Uh, My father-in-law has um, questions too about like, you know, he uses Facebook, but he doesn't quite understand Facebook at the same time. So it's amusing, but also like, you know, you, you want to like, you know, correct them. I'm like, oh, you don't want to say that because etiquette suggests that or dictates that you don't do post on this and that and someone else's post about something else. Right. Yeah. We're always teaching, teaching and learning at the same time. Roger, thank you so much. Roger Chang is the producer at the Daily Tech News Show uh, that you can find at thedailytechnewsshow.com. And uh, you will also be on the new screensavers coming up on June 6th. You're going to be a part of that episode, right? Yes. I'm looking forward to it. (laughs) Well, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Good to see you. Take care. Bye. Coming up, crazy Elon Musk stories and Bill Gates, his beach reads. But first, this episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Blue Apron. You know that part in the movie Interstellar where they go to the planet where every day is 67 hours long? That is what I need. Unfortunately, I'm stuck with the standard 24-hour day for now, which never leaves me enough time to both go to the grocery store and cook dinner and keep up with the daily tech news. That's where Blue Apron comes in. Blue Apron makes cooking delicious meals stress-free by delivering fresh, ready-to-cook meals right to your door. For less than $10 per meal, Blue Apron sends you fresh ingredients perfectly proportioned with step-by-step recipe instructions, including beautifully printed pictures, making cooking healthy meals really easy and fun. No trips to the grocery store, no waste from unused ingredients. Each balanced meal is 500 to 700 calories per serving. Cooking takes half an hour. Shipping is free and the menus are always new, they won't send the same meal twice. They work around your schedule and your dietary preferences. And Blue Apron's experts source only the best seasonal ingredients for incredible meals like flat iron steaks with ramps, fingerling potatoes, and shaved asparagus salad, and rice flake crusted hake with sautéed daikon, radish, and yuzo soy sauce. I shocked myself that the meal we cooked was made by me. It was really fresh and it was good. Even my kids liked it and they are really suspicious of my cooking. Blue Apron, it's a bitter way to cook. Check out this week's menu and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's right, two free meals just for going to blueapron.com slash twit. And we thank Blue Apron for their support of Tech News Tonight. And you're in luck. It's a two for Tuesday today. We have another guest. Our second guest is Molly Brown from Geek Wire. Welcome, Molly. Hi, how are you? I am good. Now, you cover geek culture mostly. I always love reading your pieces, uh, so I'm glad that you could come on to talk about a few today. First, I wanted to talk about, you have a story about Ashley Vance's book that came out today, Elon Musk, Tesla, SpaceX, and the Quest for a Fantastic Future. You have an excellent roundup of some crazy Musk behavior that we might not already know about. What What are one of the craziest stories in there? Oh, my God. Well, um, I have to think that Musk is is probably the most interesting dynamic guy right now in Silicon Valley. And I think everybody on the internet is pretty obsessed with him, including me at this point. There is so much craziness in here. I mean, it's like an episode of Entourage meets, you know, maybe some crazy like Steve Jobs stories from the 80s. And, you know, Musk swears a lot and he says exactly what he's thinking at all times. Um, And he doesn't pull any punches. Like even when he's talking to, you know, the Bloomberg Business Week reporter, Ashley Vance, you know, he calls people names. He, you know, calls really big people out on really cruddy behavior. And, it's quite refreshing, actually. There's no PR like smokescreen going on here, you know, so it's really amusing read. Yeah. Now, he has apparently something against acronyms. Yeah. So there's this infamous email that he sent out the entire company, and there's actually a couple of them documented in the book. And apparently, because you know how Silicon Valley and tech guys like to make up, I shouldn't say guys, but it is mostly guys, make up acronyms to make themselves feel important, right? So they'll be like, oh, I'm going to make this up. And, you know, anyway, Musk was like, I've had it with this. So he sent out a company-wide email. And uh, Vance says in the book, it's one of his most notorious emails that was like, acronyms seriously suck. Like that was the subject line. And it was like, you guys knock it off. And the email is just insanely long, but, um, the, the, ju- the juxta of it or the right there was nobody's going to do this anymore. Like don't use acronyms. It's confusing. And if anybody's going to do it, it's going to be me. 
Um, so that was pretty great. There was another great email he sent about profit sharing. Um, I guess some SpaceX employees were upset about uh, their pay or profit sharing or something. And uh, he sent an email about it and was basically like, you know, I'm assuming you're all brilliant at playing the stock market. So, you know, if you are, you know, of the notion that you're going to become a billionaire hedge funder, you know, by your choices, feel free to go ahead, you know, if you can figure out when to sell the stock to become a billionaire. And it was just really, really funny. It is refreshing because he doesn't seem to have a filter. And, and, and especially on Twitter, I loved it when he was on the episode of The Simpsons. And, uh, you know, there was something, they said something about making fun of him because he was using so much rocket fuel. And then the next day, it just had a complete Twitter storm about how you could never, there's never going to be space elevators. You're never going to be able to, you know, you have to use rocket fuel. It was just, it's amazing. It's refreshing to see. Yeah, his Twitter account's really amazing. And if you're not following him, you really should because he's, he's really on there. He's quite prolific. And as soon as SpaceX does anything, like with a launch or a test or whatever, he's posting vines, he's posting pictures, he's telling you how it went. Um, his Twitter avatar, if he hasn't changed it since I last checked, is him posing as Dr. Evil petting a cat. So he's a humorous guy. So you also have a story about uh, Bill Gates. He has a list of his recommended beach reads on his blog. Um, I was really surprised. One of his, uh, his first one is Ali Brosh's Hyperbole and a Half. I don't know if you've read that, but it is absolutely one of my favorite books. It's a graphic novel. It's so funny. I mean, it's definitely not appropriate for children. Uh, but I would have not thought that that was Bill Gates' sense of humor. Yeah, you know, I am familiar with her work in the blog. I don't think I've read the entire book. Um, but he did say in his post and in his video that he was trying to include some more fun, lighthearted things for this summer. And I think when people think about Bill Gates, they think he's a pretty serious guy, right? Um, but he's, you know, he seems to have a really good sense of humor and he's very comfortable with that. And he honestly gave a nod to Melinda as, you know, kind of pointing him in the direction and, and laughing and, you know, and helping him out with some of his picks. And, you know, I think that's pretty appropriate. I mean, the guy has great taste. I used to, you know, work for a book magazine and review a lot of these books. And he is a great reader and he's very picky. So he's not going to recommend anything that's going to be a waste of your time. Okay. Well, you can check that out on GeekWire, and we have a link to that on our show notes. Finally, I want to talk to you about a story you posted today about the tray typer from KFC. Uh, please tell us about this amazing invention. Okay. Well, it's they tested it in Germany. It was part of an ad campaign in restaurants, and it was really trying to more of like the, the social aspect to get people to actually use it and say they were using it as part of the campaign. And basically it's that paper tray liner that, you know, you just slop ketchup on and, you know, throw away at the end of your meal. Well, this uh, agency basically made this really thin, lightweight, uh, blue tube enabled tray that you can get greasy, you know, you can do whatever, you can eat on it, but it connects to your smartphone. So while you're sitting there eating fried chicken, you can be keying on the keypad and emailing or texting or on Twitter. It doesn't matter. And as anybody or everybody who knows who eats at their keyboard and we're all guilty of it, um, that can get pretty gross pretty fast. So I know this was a one-off campaign they did in Germany, but it was so popular that every single customer, the agency reports, took it with them. <laughs> so they, were like they allowed to take it with them or they, they yeah. weren't stealing it? Oh, yeah, they weren't stealing it. They took it. And um, it was immensely popular and successful. They said it really fired up the social feeds and it worked exactly the way they wanted it to. So I don't know if they're going to test this in the United States. I really kind of hope they do, even though... You know, I'm, I'm not really a fast food advocate in any sense of the term, but I have to say if, if, if this was, you know, something that restaurants were putting in or maybe they were in airports, it, it would be pretty cool. I know. I was going to say, I don't eat chicken, but I do eat a lot of greasy things. So I do, I would like a Bluetooth enabled paper keyboard for lunchtime. Yeah. That was great. Well, Molly, thank you so much for coming on. Molly Brown is a writer and editor at GeekWire. Uh, you can find her stuff at GeekWire or at Evil Molly on Twitter.
Great. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can get the audio or the video version there. Or you can go to iTunes or Stitcher or Instacast or Downcast or Overcast or Undercast or whatever cast. You can get our podcasts on our shows there. Let us know if you have any questions or comments about this or any episode. Operators are standing by at TN2 at twit.tv. Or you can bypass the operators and email me directly at Megan at twit.tv. And of course, you can watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today. That's every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I am Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.